A warm, warm welcome to everyone here at Fotografiska in Stockholm and to everyone joining us online. This is Open Perspectives by H&M Foundation, shifting the narrative to transform the system. Open Perspectives is an inspirational forum to discuss challenges, learnings and solutions to accelerate the transformation to an inclusive and planet-positive textile industry and beyond. My name is Lina Tomsgård and I'm deeply honored and glad that I will be walking you through the following hour. It will be an inspirational hour and I, I assure you that you all will live with some good tools to use on your own transformational journeys. How can we use storytelling to accelerate change? To transform large complex systems, we need to make sure that the people within and around the systems actually believe that the system can change and can imagine what that change will look like. And during Open Perspectives today, we will explore how a shift in our worldviews could open new paths to a brighter future and be a key enabler in creating a more inclusive society and textile industry. Research shows us that by using expert insights and data combined with hopeful storytelling, we have a powerful tool for transformation. So let's learn how to harness the power of perception. A few words about the H&M Foundation. The H&M Foundation is an independent, philanthropic global foundation that works to enable a socially inclusive and planet-positive textile industry. A future where the industry operates within the planetary boundaries, contributing to a society where people and planet not only survive, but thrive. The foundation also aims to create inspiring storytelling, to shift narratives, bringing diverse partners together to co-create and share learnings and solutions. And the textile industry is one example of a complex system that needs to transform to create a positive future for people and planet. But what we will talk about during this program today is applicable to any human system. I assure you that every one of you here will live with the tools and learnings to do that. Today we will meet uh, researchers, change makers and experts on the future. You will be hearing about challenges as well as possibilities and inspiring stories of cases that show us the change is possible. So let's get started. Our first keynote speaker will talk about how change can help transform complex systems. Please give a warm welcome to Pad Olsson, Associate Professor, Principal Researcher and Program Director at Stockholm Resilience Center. Welcome, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, and thanks for having me. It's fantastic to be here and uh, be part of this morning. Um, yeah, so we heard that large-scale, deep, rapid transformations are, are needed. And the hopeful thing is that a lot of actors out in the world are realizing that and want to be part of that. So they, they, there are many actors within private, public, and, and also civil society that talks about transformative change. And it often builds on an insight that you heard here that the systems that we created, uh, food system, textile system or industry, um, the energy system, even the, econo the global economic systems, uh, are not delivering on the things that were important, that we think are important. So often we talk about uh, equity and, and sustainability. And historically, when we have realized that the systems don't deliver on certain things, we have changed systems, we have transformed. And, but I think there's a couple of things that we need to be, um, have with us when we talk about transformation. And one, the first thing that I would just want to talk a little bit about, about is, the, is the definition that we use when we talk about transformation and what we include in the word uh, transformation. And uh, the word transformation um, for us includes often like um, a fundamental shift in practices or, or behaviors, 
uh, rules and regulations, but also deeper uh, values and perception, as we talked about here. And we also include, uh, or in our studies, we include uh, a focus on uh, resource flows, so who is getting what and how, roles and routines, who is doing what and how, and the power issue of who is deciding what and how. And from the Resilience Center perspective also, we're really interested in understanding the fundamental shift that is needed in our relationship to the planet. So sometimes when we talk about transformative change, we say that it includes at least three um, relationships or a fundamental shift in three relationships. So the first one is the relationship to ourselves and the inner work that we have to do in order to be change makers in the world and change systems. It, the other one is the relationship to others and including future generations. And the, the third one is the relationship to the planet. So, but in order then for, for stories and, and, and narratives to, to contribute to these systemic transformations, there are at least two aspects that needs to be addressed and that I'm going to talk about. And the first one is, is um, highlighted by this very simple, very simple figure, uh, the X-curve. But what it says that it, we, when it comes to transformations, we have to work in two dimensions. We have to work in the dimension of the white curve, of, of, of new ideas, uh, innovations that emerge and then hopefully are scaled to have some kind of maybe transformative effect on society, that's the white curve. That's the one that we often tell stories about. So the focus is often on, on sort of the positive stories of, of, of scaling these new ideas, or even trying them out and experimenting with new ideas. But what we t talk less about is the, is the pink curve here, and that's the, the, the process of phasing out, uh, letting go, and, and, and and maybe unlearn so that the new things can, can emerge. So actually phasing out the systems that created the problems in the first place. So um, there is a quote that I usually show that really capture, I think, the work that we have to do in these two dimensions. And this is the quote by John Vasconcellos, who was a senator in, in, in the US. He's, he talks about that at the same time as we have to be with my, uh, midwives for, for, for uh, giving birth to the new and care for the new, new ideas, innovations, we also have to be hospice workers to, to help the, the old, the old systems or part of the systems die and hopefully die with dignity. And I, I want to emphasize uh, the dignity uh, uh, word here. With, with an example that illustrates that. And this is, the, this is a picture of, of uh, Vattenfall, a Swedish uh, energy company that, had, that actually closed their last uh, coal, coal plant in, in uh, the Netherlands a couple of years ago. And as you can see in this picture here, uh, of course they, they, they used a lot of like the, the normal things to use in, in these kind of transitions, like you help people. Uh, so Vattenfall worked with the, the, the Dutch state to sort of help people through this, to, to, to uh, maybe have an early retirement, to have uh, you go into reskilling, etc. But what I wanted to talk about maybe more is what you see in this picture is that they showed. Uh, this movie on the facade of the of the factory um, weeks ahead of the, the the closing the plant, and it's actually a video installation by Henk Wildschut, where he sort of gathers these groups of people, uh, film them, a, a close up, do a sweep over the group, and then this group leave the the room. A new group comes in, and he does the same. And this you can find this on YouTube. And this, is, this to me was a, a way of working with hospice, is to realize and, and respect these people that are losing out. Because we can talk about win-win, you know, everybody's going to win. If we, if we transform now, everybody's going to win in the future. But actually people feel like losers at the moment. 
And we have to take care of those feelings. Because these feelings, often um, that involves uh, grief and fear, grief of losing uh, identity uh, and fear of losing income, those feelings can easily become feelings of, of uh, anger and hate. And we know that hate can become a very uh, destructive force in society. And we also know that in the fossil industry, for example, there are a lot of men uh, that are losing out. And there are lots of studies, actually, that, f that focus on what happens to these men and these feelings, and where do they go when they vote, and when, how they behave on social media, etc. So it's crucial that the stories and the narratives that we tell actually include these dimensions, the dimensions of, of both the positive and innovation and, and scaling, but also the hospice. Because there's a lot of people that feel excluded from the imagining the future, excluded from being involved in creating the, the new, but also feeling threatened by facing out. It's absolutely crucial that we work with inclusiveness, fairness, and diverse voice in what we call just transitions. That should definitely be part of the, 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 the stories. Because uh, these kind of destructive force, when I talk about a destructive force, uh, it's about, um, you know, the, the, that, there are, that it could give fuel to uh, sort of more populistic stories. Because there are competing stories out there, competing narratives in these moments also when we have a, a great opportunity to take a big leap and a big step towards sustainability and, uh, and uh, equity, there's also competing stories that comes in that has a different idea of the transformative pathway. So absolutely crucial to in include that. The last thing I just want to mention, the last aspect, um, is that in complex systems that we heard here um, in the beginning by Lina, in complex systems, we know that solutions create problems. We have to realize that it has to be part of the stories. Because we can talk about, uh, as we do in this report, together with Swedish companies and SIDA, we look at if we're really successful at the green transition in Sweden, what kind of positive, uh, no, what kind of um, unintended, maybe, and unexpected consequences can that have on uh, low- and middle-income countries. And what we see here is that, of course, you can have stories about circularity, um, uh, plant-based diets, uh, green transitions. They're very positive and looks very good, but at the same time, then, uh, we, can, we can also, there are also stories of of uh, if you look at the electronic waste, for example, as, as part of circularity, the horrible pictures from Ghana, where a lot of these e-waste is is uh, is ending up. So it's absolutely important that we have frameworks of actions that allow for for testing solutions, but also that keeps uh, an eye on these unexpected and unintended consequences. So we need positive stories about the future, but we also need realistic stories of, of how it is to navigate these very difficult processes where you have joy and grief at the same time, where you, had, where you have midwifery and hospice work at the same time. And, and, um, and allow for, for all these stories to, to, uh, to be included. Thank you. Thank you so much, Per. Uh, I'm known for being very easily moved, but I was, I was very moved by the factory and the pictures mm. of the workers there, yeah. giving them dignity. Uh, what you've been talking about, it, it feels like I get inspired. I want to do this. Yep. I want to work with both the curves. Mm. How do we do it? What tools do we have? Yeah, I think there, there is uh, many tools that are actually developed for situations where we have high uncertainty, but also high innov innovative capacities. So that's the kind of the methods that you should look for. So Three Horizons, for example, that has been developed by uh, Bill Sharp and others. 
is one of those methods where they actually work with the X curve. They also have a, a third curve, the third horizon uh, in there. What's the, what, which one is that? That's, so you have, a, you have the a one curve, as I showed, for the, the Innovation, future. Innovation, future. The, the possible futures. Yeah. You have one curve for the now, what yeah. the current system. But then you also have a, an in-between curve, which provides a sort of a stepping stone like what is the, what are the innovation if the if the if the sort of the 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 future curve is like oh that's that's so far into the future regenerative agriculture etc there are there are innovations there are pockets of innovation right now but it's not it's not scaled yet right so then you might think about what what kind of stepping stones do we do we have at the moment where it's actually it's a softer uh, and, and more, maybe more possible uh, journey towards that future. So I think that's, so you work with, you can work with it in companies uh, to transform your company, but also in, in sort of any collaborative process. And then also that I know that H&M Foundation is working with this um, because I saw Mark Cabage on a, a social media. Yeah, and, and uh, I love him, um, uh, but he, he works with something called developmental evaluation, which is an evaluation method that is developed for situations where you have high uncertainty, um, and, um, but high innovative capacities. But you're not always sure what, if I, if I do this uh, solution, uh, we, might, you know, we might achieve what we thought we're going to achieve, mm -hmm. but there's a great possibility that a lot of other things are going to happen, both positive and negative. The new problems. Yeah. 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 Do we have any, any good tools to prepare ourselves for the new problems? Sorry? Do we have any good tools to prepare ourselves for new problems? Yeah, but I think, I think that's uh, the developmental evaluation is, is uh, a method that helps us prepare. And, and uh, you know, in how we're monitoring things, for example, because we're often in a linear thinking. We have already decided the indicators and what we measure, and, and, and we, we're going to stick to that. But actually, you have to be very flexible and change that all the time. And I think the developmental evaluation method actually prepares you better for going into uh, those complex systems with a different approach. Thank you, Per, for those two tools, the Three Horizon and the... The developmental, the developmental evaluation. evaluation. Yes. Thank you so much. I will invite you back on stage <laughs> later on today. Thank you, Thank so, you so much. much. So, uh, we are at Fotografiska in Stockholm. Uh, anyone who's here, you saw the beautiful view of the well, winter landscape when entering. Fotografiska in Stockholm is one of the world's most prominent museums for contemporary photography. And the H&M Foundation and Fotografiska Stockholm are joining forces in the quest to inspire and encourage positive change through the power of visual communication. And one of their collaborations is the exhibition The Echo Chamber by photographer Erik Johansson. All of you are here. We're going to go and see this exhibition afterwards. Uh, through the ex exhibition, The Echo Chamber, different scenarios illustrate how shifts in our own perception of the world can open up paths to a brighter future. So let's have a glimpse of the exhibition right now. Fotografiska Stockholm and H&M Foundation are collaborating with the aim to raise awareness of environmental and social issues. We believe in the power of photography where experiences through a lens can connect, question and inspire new perspectives. Usually my exhibitions are about uh, capturing a set of images that I combine into an exhibition. But in this case we started with, uh, with a topic, with a theme, and then I have developed images specifically for this exhibition. I think the echo chamber is a very interesting topic that always surrounds us and something that is always affecting us. And that's why I thought that it would be a very interesting exhibition to make around this topic and try to figure out how to capture that in different concepts. To fix the broken systems, uh, we need to start by changing the narrative around them. The power in perception can be a key enabler to reduce poverty, improve education and fight inequality. 
We truly believe that communication can play a big part of painting the vision of how a reinvented and socially inclusive textile industry can actually look like. And we share inspiring stories to motivate that change. My work is a lot about twisting perspectives in different ways. And I think also in this exhibition, it's also about making us realize our perspectives on other things as well. It has been a very interesting concept to work with. And I believe that the exhibition is not supposed to give answers. It's more about asking questions. And I hope that people will feel inspired and think a little bit differently after they visit the exhibition. And I really hope that the way that we see the world is something that, that will really help the world to become better as well, if we understand each other better. An echo chamber is a phenomena that occurs when a group of similarly minded people only share information and ideas with each other, and in that way amplify their views and their perspectives uh, instead of challenging them, their views and perspectives petrifies. And as Pad just said, you know, about the pink curve and the people perhaps getting left behind when a system change, how do we communicate with them? And if you are a part of the pink curve, does anyone listen to you? To challenge ourselves, perhaps we need to challenge our worldview and search for the ones who disagree with us or on the other curves, perhaps. And some inspiration on how to do that will hopefully be delivered by our next panel. Please give a warm welcome to Charlotte Brunström, Strategy Lead for Inclusive Societies at H&M Foundation, and Andrew Merry, Head of Futures and Research Lead at Planethon, a partner of the Echo Chamber Exhibition. We're going to talk about how narratives about a positive future can, can accelerate change. But I would like to start with a few words on, of women and technology. Because as we all know, prejudice uh, around women and technology are a global problem. We see women as caring and not as suitable for technical jobs. And that has, of course, significant implications for gender equality and representation in the field of technology. Uh, the stereotypes that inhibit women in the labor market, they lead to women being overlooked at job opportunities, promotions, and leadership positions. And Charlotte, you have been working on a project within the textile industry in Bangladesh, where you fight this prejudice against, uh, around women and technology. Could you please tell us a bit about the consequences that these prejudices have for women in the textile industry? Sure. So the textile industry is currently adopting to the green transition and there's also an automation and digitalization going on. And that will definitely uh, give new job opportunities. But we also see a great risk that this transition will also risk that millions of people in the industry is actually getting, to, getting you know, unemployed and will lose their jobs. Pink curve. Exactly. So this is particularly true for the women workers in production. Uh, so, because of this, we have initiated this very large program in Bangladesh in production to address exactly this. Uh, because in Bangladesh, the workforce in the textile industry is uh, about 60% female, uh, but still a very small percentage of the women workforce work as managers or supervisors or are the ones you know, in charge of the high-tech machineries at the factory floor. Uh, so this is a, a huge problem, and the reason for this is twofold. Uh, first of all, women in Bangladesh, in production in general, are very poorly educated and lack the necessary skills, and they are sometimes even illiterate. Uh, but there's also a huge problem around their per perception around women in general in the country, right? Uh, so there's some deep-rooted stereotypes going on. They are saying that, uh, for example, tech is for boys. Uh, women cannot handle advanced tech. Um, women are not born natural leaders, and so they are not capable of any leadership position. So I think that's actually the biggest challenge we are facing right now uh, in our program. And coming back to your question around the, you know, the consequences mm. for the women in the industry, well, they are very severe and challenging, I would say. And how do you work to address them, the consequences? 
Right, so we are providing the women workforce with different kind of skilling initiatives uh, in order to really try to equip them for the future jobs that will arise. Uh, but we also, of course, coming back to the perception change work, work a lot with the narrative around women in general as well. Uh, so take the case of a 25-year-old woman worker in Bangladesh working at one of the factories in Dhaka. And one way the HR department at her factory announces that there's a new job position coming up. It's actually a manager position. So she gets very excited and interested and, and she goes home to bounce the idea with her family. But her mother-in-law and her husband actually are getting really furious about her even you know, considering the idea of taking on this higher position. Because they are afraid of a lot of things. They worry that people in their community will start to talk about them, will judge them. Because in Bangladesh, uh, the, ma the man, the husband, is supposed to be the breadwinner of the family and not the woman. They are also afraid that if she gets promoted and have that higher ranking position mm. than her husband, uh, she will be less willing to obey him and less interested also in taking care of the kids at home and the, you know, the family uh, household chores in, in general. So this is a good as example, I think, of the daily challenges that these women in production are facing. So even though this particular woman maybe will be very well equip equipped to take on this new uh, job, uh, the uh, perception of her in society is still against her. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about how we, what we can do to change that. But uh, when we talk about these inclusive societies, perhaps uh, making sure the two curves talk to each other, making sure that that woman's story reaches us here and the audience online, we always uh, we often talk about like, who gets to be invited to the table. Like inclusive societies, everyone here at the table. But perhaps that is not imaginative enough. Andrew, Planethon, who is also a partner to the Echo Chamber exhibition, that is a transformation agency, right? Yep. So if we want to transform into a more inclusive society in the future, what can we learn from the past and the present? So I think one of the most important things we can learn from the past is it's easy to feel like in the present and when we're dealing with these extremely challenging issues, that we're the first ones ever to have dealt with them. Uh, and that this is something that is unprecedented. Mm. And I think what we can learn a lot from history uh, is that people have gone through extremely challenging processes and made societies better. I always like to go back to the inspiration of Marie Wollstonecraft, who wrote Vindication on the Rights of Women in 1792, which is still, when you read it, it feels like it could have been written last year. It's satirical, it's like so insightful and reflective, and it was not until 50 years later that the women's suffrage movement uh, in the United Kingdom actually really kicked off. And some years after that, and I'm proud to say, uh, women were first granted the vote in New Zealand uh, at the very end of the 19th century. So that's a very kind of long process. So what we can learn is also is all of this struggle and this effort that we're putting into trying to uh, you know, tell different stories, trying to put different ideas out into the world, uh, those can take some time to kind of marinate. And I think, of course, what we need to learn from the present is how can we accelerate those things? Mm -hmm. How can we make sense of all of this energy and competing perspectives and new social movements? And the fact that people are really starting to understand their identity uh, in many different ways. You know, I think As in, I'm not only a woman, I'm also a textile worker, or perhaps a data programmer, or I have a exactly. background from another country. Or You're many things at once, and, and so are those men, perhaps. I think that often, you, know, in, you could imagine in a situation like Bangladesh, they also perform a certain set of roles of how they're expected to act, in a society as a, as a man. And I think part of building an inclusive society is how you allow people to be more of who their identity is in these spaces we try to create change. So we will still be inviting people to the table, but they will not be the woman. They might be able to be a lot of things, sit at a lot of different chairs. Indeed, but maybe you also need to kind of flip the table upside down and like sit on the ground and do something else, because sometimes the idea of sitting around a table tends to reinforce the existing kind of power dynamics. And you can do a lot with actually creating, changing the way that people engage to try to allow them to bring in more perspectives. Flipping the table, that's... I like that. Can you give us, Andrew, some examples of shifted narratives linked to positive change? 
Sure. So, I mean, probably the absolute classic one uh, is the LGBTQI movement uh, and how that has started off and has really led to kind of world changing change, not everywhere, but in many places around the world. And often that can, and when we talk about narratives and stories, people say, but you're just talking about stories. How is that action? But language mm -hmm. is action. And in fact, it's been said that one of the really like moments that helped to shift the movement for, for rights for people with different gender identities mm -hmm. was changing the legal term in legislation for the way that kind of gay people and lesbians and others were, were talked about. And, and then that allowed then that to be kind of decriminalized and opened up a lot of change over. So language mm -hmm. is itself an incredibly powerful tool. And that's what I think is so exciting with the work that H&M Foundation is doing, the way it talks about women in Bangladesh, the way it talks about things. It's changing the fundamental language. Language can go viral. It can be like this virus that can spread and start to change the norms and the way we engage in each other, because that's our way of connecting socially. Uh, language matters, words matters, and we've already mentioned that in order to create change, the people within and around the system actually need to believe that it can change. Exactly. And also that they can imagine what that change will look like. So, Charlotte, uh, whether it's, it's us in this room and how we need to believe that a change is possible, or the women in Bangladesh, we, we need to be able to have that imagination. What are your yes. learnings on that from Bangladesh? Because you've worked with role models, right? Absolutely. But also coming back to what you said, Andrew, earlier as well about communication. Communication is a very powerful tool, like you say, to change the norms and beliefs and the perception around women in general, right? So that's why we work a lot with communication and awareness campaigns in our work as well in Bangladesh. Uh, for instance, we have, together with our partner organization, a soap opera on TV. Uh, which is highlighting key messages around the importance of gender equality and also the importance of questioning these negative stereotypes and, and traditional gender norms. So that uh, will be one way of reaching the mother-in-law to the definitely female textile worker. Definitely, on the soap opera, Because yeah, she could see yes, on TV that a exactly. woman can be a yes. manager without leaving her family. Yes. Or, yeah. Uh, another example is that we are also together with our partner organization uh, having different talk shows on TV and on the radio in Bangladesh, uh, trying to gather different stakeholders, talking about the same topic is, is, and issues that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and we also have a lot of like interactive edutainment, it's called, street shows uh, you know, that you know, people passing by are involved in as well. So making people aware of you know, the need for change and aware of the current narratives that are very negative around women. And coming back to your question about the, the role models as well, those are vital, I think, in this work as well. Um, I can give you one example. So we are going to establish a, a mentor network of female leaders in Bangladesh. And those women are all working as different kind of leaders, managers or supervisors, etc., on different uh, factories around in Dhaka. Do, uh, only textile industries or exactly. mentors from other textile industries? In yeah. the textile industry, exactly. So we have high hopes that these women will then encourage and, and support the other women in the, in the factories and really like encourage them to take on managerial positions as well and really creating an enabling and supporting environment which is really necessary as well for these women to, to work in. And we also wanted to connect that network of female leaders to the supervisors and management at the factory so that they can guide them to work more gender inclusive. But it's also very important to tell you that uh, the men, the husbands, also needs to be involved, right? Mm. This is not only for the women. Mm. So we work a lot with the husbands and men in society in general, trying to engage them in different discussion forums and workshops. They don't watch the soap operas? No, not necessarily. <laughs> so we're trying to engage them in those that kind of discussions to awake their interest and understanding of why is it necessary and beneficial for them as well, to be honest, to mm. change the narrative around women. Mm. So trying to find the early adopters mm. among the men as well mm. and have them as good example of mm. you know, good behaviors in society. So those are role models as well. If you can see it, then you can be it. Exactly. Uh, one thing that is important here is creating good things for people and planet and like to connect the two. And if it wasn't challenging enough to question our own worldview 
and to talk to the people who might not be close to ourselves. Our imagination is also affected by these biases, by prejudice and assumptions. So Andrew, the, the big question here, how can we work to widen our own perspectives? What can we in this room do? What can our followers and joiners online do to widen our own perspectives? Yeah. So one thing is I think that we you know, often talk about the, the power of the future and helping us to kind of reconsider and reflect on the present. And, and when you're using future scenarios and writing stories, you can obviously force or kind of test out different perspectives. And you can write also, when you talk from the future, you can also really shed light on what is really absurd or crazy about things in the present, either that we hold ourselves, about our relationship with the planet, what are the kind of biases and assumptions we can hold. And if you actually want to kind of broaden your perspective, you have to be able to be aware of, of what those are. Like, take your behavior and the way we operate, take that into the future, and then look back on the present, and you'll often find that much of that is, is absurd. I think collective imagination is really important also, that we imagine together. Okay. Because when we try to do it ourselves, we obviously, as you said, have your own kind of bias and perspectives, but if we imagine with other people, all of those perspectives come into one space, uh, and then they kind of have to uh, find comfort with each other, or how do you kind of live in the, the tension and that discomfort to work out, okay, well, how do we actually have uh, different kinds of perspectives and make sure that it's not one dominant perspective that's actually kind of taking over the whole, the whole space. Uh, so I think, and that's again a little bit about flipping the table. Yeah, Maybe sitting the, down, yeah, collective not imagination. Not actually having yeah. everyone sitting around the table and talking about them as stakeholders, but in fact, how can you imagine a new future together and allow everyone to kind of be part of that? And that can obviously then to help you to work out what are the dominant perspectives and how could we uh, use other ones that are more suited to this kind of collect, this uh, connection between people and planet. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Andrew. I will be inviting both of you back on stage in a short while. Thank you. Thanks. Now, everyone, we're going to Bangalore, India. Circularity is one, of, one piece of the puzzle in creating a planet-positive fashion industry. And as the fashion industry is leaving take, make, waste behind, there's increasing demand for recycled raw materials. And there are multiple challenges with this one. One is making sure that the materials are sustainably sourced, not only from a, from a planet perspective, but also making sure that the value chains are socially inclusive, which means that the planet and the people has to work together. Because many planet-friendly initiatives tend to forget the social implications they bring. Some initiative, initiatives even further marginalize the people currently making a living on contributing to the circular economy. H&M Foundation drives a multi-stakeholder initiative equipping informal waste pickers to lift themselves out of poverty and bringing them closer to the formal sector while providing the textile industry with sustainably sourced recycled materials. And this is a collaboration with BBC Media Action. BBC Media Action is the BBC's international charity. They're using media and communication for good, reaching more than 100 million people each year in some of the world's poorest countries. Through their work, they help save lives, protect livelihoods, counter misinformation, challenge prejudice, and build democracy. Let's go visit them in Bangalore. Bangalore, a city of over 130 million, India's Silicon Valley and a startup hub. It's also a city of 22,500 informal waste pickers, a group that finds no recognition as a labor force and remains largely unnoticed. Even though they stop over 383 million kilograms of waste from reaching landfills every year and save the local municipal department around $10 million annually, but 55% of the general population think of them as dirty, 44% think of them as thieves, and 56% say they shouldn't be allowed in residential areas. We often see the waste on the streets, but not the people who help manage it. Jana, namuna galiju hantare, 
ಕಳ್ರು ಅಂತಾರೆ ವಾಚ್ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಗೇಲಿ ಸಮೇತ ನಮ್ಮನ್ನ ದೂರ ಹಿಡಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ವಿ ವರ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೈರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಜೂದಿತ್ ಬಟ್ಲರ್ಸ್ ಥಿಯರಿ ಆಫ್ ಲಿವಬಲ್ ಲೈಫ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಲಿಫ್ಟ್ ದ ಶ್ರೌಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ವಿಸಿಬಿಲಿಟಿ ಟು ರಿವೀಲ್ ದ ವರ್ಕ್ ಇನ್ ಲೈಫ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವೇ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಫಾರ್ ಇಟ್ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವೇರ್ ವಿ ಯೂಸ್ಡ್ ಬಟ್ಲರ್ಸ್ ರೀಫ್ರೇಮಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಶೇಪ್ ಆರ್ ಥಿಯರಿ ಆಫ್ ಚೇಂಜ್ ಲೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಆರ್ ಇನ್ ಸೈಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಟರ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ನೆಸ್ ವಿ ಸೆಟ್ ಔಟ್ ಟು ರೀಫ್ರೇಮ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ಸ್ ಪರ್ಸೆಪ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೊಸಿಷನಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಇನ್ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಇನ್ ವ್ಯಾಲ್ಯೂಬಲ್ ದ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕ್ಯಾಂಪೇನ್ was done with a social experiment film using the facebook feature of a friend request to reveal the waste pickers or the invaluables as friends we did not know we have had after four years something told us that we had come a full circle our intervention started with a friend request and last week i got one from mansoor one of the waste pickers that we have been working with for me it shows that the shroud of invisibility is lifting and that interconnectedness is being established our invaluables journey has been one of stories collaborators audiences influencers and the invaluables themselves I love my city Bengaluru for its clean and green surroundings. Waste pickers do so much to keep it this way. I got to know that a simple act of washing the boxes we get food in can help our invaluables recycle more. So I didn't just make a habit of it, I also created something on my own to spread the word. So others would do it too. After all, nothing spreads like a good story. No. Hello, I'm Vasu Dikshit. For me, the Happy Number song brought together so many things that are close to me: music, sustainable living, and storytelling. Connecting with my audience through meaningful work was really pleasing. But what it also did was bring me close to those people. who are managing our city's waste never seen always working i'm just happy that my song could take them their work and their importance to people out there and turn 38325 not 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 into an emotion 38325 not 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 namma bengalurina happy number namma bengalurina happy number i'm extremely grateful for the response our story about the plight of waste pickers in bengaluru has received across social media platforms instagram facebook linkedin twitter and whatsapp downloaded and shared very very widely on whatsapp this piece has resonated with our viewers it has moved them but more importantly reminded them how important responsible waste disposal is and how they can make a difference in the lives of our waste pickers and for content creators like me who have a platform who have an audience it has shown that influencing can be done for good why are we doing this russian doll thing chips packet inside this pet bottle she is not going to pick this up for recycling because too much work getting this plastic wrapper out of the plastic bottle mat karo aisa collaborating with content creators across genres has been a key pillar to our outreach and growth strategy a few content creators collaborated with us for multiple phases of the campaign making conversations seamless and establishing a sense of continuity the impact achieved through this approach has now led us to license content free of cost to local vernacular media platforms in order to expand the audience base engaging with the invaluable's campaign Asridala has been working in Bangalore over a decade with waste pickers. It is equally important to change the perception of citizens, consumers about waste pickers who provide invaluable services to the city. Shamuika Shakti has given an opportunity to do the same. To see the many different partners of an alliance coming together along with those outside to create something that is bigger than its sum of parts for me that has been the most important takeaway i've seen the happy number song coffee with recyclers wash the dabba all resonating equally with the population of the waste pickers and the general population proving that we are all after all interconnected to monitor learn 
course correct and evaluate continuously. Here are the key highlights of impact on the three key focus areas from our theory of change. Reveal or creating awareness of the way speakers, building empathy and establishing interconnectedness. These results are from our longitudinal panel with the social media users of Bangalore that captured the stories of change over time in people's attitudes towards waste pickers. I am feeling like a little bit guilty because I made so many challenges for them. I came to know that they are the tons of the waste that has been recycled by them. I will help them as I can. Thank you so much, Appa. I am really proud of you. Thank you so much and I love you so much. We have just started the conversation, but a lot more needs to be said and a lot more needs to be heard. Many other people need to be spoken to. And to that end, we've already launched the Instagram avatar of our Invaluables brand, something that's always going to be present in the lives of our audience and is always going to be on. This will allow us to deepen our work through the insight of interconnectedness and have a model which can be transposed and which can scale up this work and solve many other challenges, reframe many other perspectives. Uh, I've seen this film five times now. I'm still moved by the part where the kids uh, say praise to their parents and tell them that they're proud of them. Uh, now as a wrap-up, I would like to welcome back all of our lovely guests today. So, Per, Andrew and Charlotte, will you please enter the stage again? First, so, some reflections uh, on the film we just saw. Anything you reacted or felt like, ooh, that I can bring home to the project? I can start. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, just like the movie showed that we spoke about earlier, the power of communication. I mean, this, this is a beautiful example of exactly that. Uh, and I know that uh, in India, in Bangalore, we're working, of course, with uh, many different stakeholders and partners. It's not only the BBC Media Action, but they are very, uh, you know, uh, knowledge about and very professional about the, the, the communication campaigns and the awareness raising campaigns within our initiative over there. Uh, but I think it's you know, such a brilliant idea to focus on uh, the following, from invisible to, to invaluable. Yeah. I mean, that's beautiful, right? And also that interconnection, making sure that you, you talk to them. Exactly. Listen to them. Bringing in the voices you give them of dignity. the people yeah, exactly. uh, with the lived experience of the problem. I think that's key. Yeah. Uh, now, together, uh, let's move into the future. Uh, Andrew, as the future expert here, Perhaps you all three are, but you're the one with the title. <laughs> so, uh, could you give us an example of a future scenario, given what we've heard today? I know this is a big one, a future scenario. And, I, and also, I would like to add, please make it hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I was to imagine this future, if we take something like the waste pickers in yep. Bengaluru, which is right now kind of still a seed of a potential future. But there are marginalized communities like this all over the world. There are so many groups of people who are invisible and could be invaluable. So if we imagined creating a, an army of invaluables all around the world, whether it's the giant uh, trash tips in parts of, of Indonesia, whether it's... Uh, know, in, in other parts of, of the world, and if they were all invaluable, like that would create uh, a situation where we actually have a huge network of humans who are helping to create the future we say that we want. Because I think that we often talk about the, the role of technology, and we kind of fetishize technology as being key to what will actually create a better future. But what is really evidenced by that 
is no, we need to change, we need to bring human dignity to the forefront, and we need to imagine how different groups of humans are part of creating this different kind of society that we say that we want. Mm -hmm. So for me, that imagination would be like, yeah, if we were to take, in a, a who are those invisible groups in every single country around the world, if we were to make them invaluable, and they were to join together, mm -hmm. what kind of society does that start to create? That Flipping the table, sit down, imagine together. Yeah, and that genuinely is then something that becomes... Um, really full of hope and transformative. Uh, per, the, the connection between what's good for the planet and what's good for the people, when I said that, I saw your head nodding like this over there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that so hard? Why does it always feel like you have to choose? Yeah, I think that's... Uh, yeah, it's how we have developed over a long time with the, that, you know, with that separation, mm. you're making, working on separating us. Mm. You know, we've been working hard at separating us from, mm. from nature, but a lot of people still hasn't, you know. Uh, they, there's a lot of groups around the world that, that haven't gone through that, and they still don't understand how we can separate, like me, mm. uh, like how we can separate that, the nature and, and, and people. So I think it's... Uh, uh, but it's, I think it's fairly easy to mend, right? Mm. And because we ha I think we have it in naturally in us, you know, that we, it comes natural to us that we are part of nature and we're completely dependent on, uh, on healthy ecosystems for our own, our own health mm. and survival. And I think that, I would just want to say that, that it's, it's about life. You know, the, 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 the planet... It will continue. We would talk about no business on a dead planet. The planet won't die. It has gone through several things <laughs> in, in, in these almost four billion years uh, that life has, has developed on the planet. So we, we get into this sort of, yeah, but we need to calculate this and the, the climate solutions, etc. We focus so much on bits and pieces, but ultimately it's about do we want to be part of this, you know, <laughs> on this journey with the planet for, for a while longer? And if we want to, uh, people joining us online and people in this room, we want to be a part of this planet for a long time. Uh, we want to be a, a part of this transformative journey that we have to do together. We want to shift our narratives in order to create that transformation. If I were to ask each one of you to give us like a, a call to action, something that everyone in here watching online that we can do today to take us a few steps closer to that. What would that be? Take this opportunity now. Should we? Let's start with you, Charlotte. All right. So then I would take this opportunity to uh, stress the importance of being inclusive, I think. Uh, I want to remind us all about, about the importance of being aware of the current power dynamics and power relations out there. And I think that's you know, relevant for everyone here, regardless of job title or position or cultural background. Being inclusive and make sure when you are in a decision-making process to always like, constantly ask yourself, like, who is at the table? Who is invited? And why do How? we have a table? Why don't we flip it? <laughs> flip the table. <laughs> but, you know, who is invited in this uh, conversation? Uh, are the voices of mm. the people with the lived experience mm. included? Is there a great diversity of perspectives and, and competences? I think that's key. And I think that, you know, if we all do that, uh, our decision will be less, much better. Uh, so, yeah, that's the thing I would like to underline right now. And uh, in that, like... If doing a bit of exercise, who are these invaluables that perhaps need to be here at the flip table? Exactly. In order for I mean, us that to make depends a good on the context, I think. So, like you were saying, we have like those kind of people everywhere. We just need to find them and bring in their voices. Uh, so this is key, I think. Great one. Andrew? So, I, I think those of us, I mean, picking up on, on what you said, I think my call to action is around those of us who have the power and privilege, be willing to be like uncomfortable to actually challenge things. We all have different things, which we see something on social media, we have a conversation with a colleague, we hear something from a family member. We need to actively be part every single day of actually challenging existing narratives and, and kind of questioning them. Almost look, looking, up, looking out for the ones who don't agree with us. 
Yeah, yeah, that too. I mean, that is, that is part of it. And I think it's not about like jumping into a forum with a bunch of climate deniers and trying to convince them. We've but, done that. But no many, success. But there's many subtleties, I think, in terms of how you engage with different kinds of questions and how you uh, challenge certain things. And, and always be willing to kind of paint an alternate future because I think right now it can be so exhausting to feel like the future's already decided and that people already have a very clear narrative and it's completely unquestionable. It's like, well, no. I mean, obviously, artificial intelligence is going to wipe out millions of jobs and we just mm. have to kind of accept that. It's like, well, mm. you don't actually. You can paint an alternative. Mm. There's a different way that humans can partner with these new technologies that are developing that creates a different kind of society. There is no inevitability. So mm. use whatever power and privilege you have to question narratives of inevitability and really, like, push them. And by doing that, you can help to kind of shift perspectives and, and bring more openness into our discussions. Brilliant. Per, mm. some finishing words for you. Yes. Mm. Uh, a lot have been said already, but I think that, that um, one of the problems that I see that we have good stories, good narratives out there, but they tend to, to end up in, the, in this sort of this polarized situation that we have now. So I think, so, you know, they have these competing stories and, and trenches, you know, you, about, uh, about growth issues, about, you know, how the governance issues, you know. And, and I think this is crucial than what's been said already, that we need to uh, create the, we need to stand in the middle, like stand in the problem together. And uh, there are lots of methods for that. Um, we have horns of the dilemma. We have all these concepts for for how do you work with that uh, cr that creative tension? The tension is important, but mm. you can actually find find the creative tension, and I think that relates a lot to what's been said already. And, and that's very ho hard to hold that space, so, but but it's absolutely crucial that we do because that's uh, where the innovation will happen between the in that in that space of tension. But I think that then requires, I love that example of, of, you know, you have to focus on working with women, but in order to prepare the system for change, you need to work with the men. You know, working on that is different curves. And I, I know there's a lot of um, these, uh, these uh, projects around the world called, uh, you know, transfor transforming masculinity. Uh, I think it's super important. And that's a realization also that the kind of capacities that we need in order to meet there in the middle and to have these uh, uh, create, uh, creative tension. Thank you. Um, I'm going to summarize all of your three call to actions into one sentence now. Everyone, we need to step out of our echo chambers. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to thank you all. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Per, for joining us. Thanks, Fotografiska at Stockholm, for being here. Thank you to the audience online, and thanks to everyone here. Now you're going to be welcome downstairs to watch the exhibition, and I'm so glad that you joined us all. Thank you. Thank you.